Zero Zero, going down. Roger, going down. Still came to be on. It'll take a minute though. Hey, for it to and now come this up. is the bridge. Go ahead, bridge. You want us to go back into TP and position hold? Yes, that'd be great. Hey, Roger, that will do. Jake Bonney to please make a note in the red book that we re-zeroed with 15 meters of payout on the uh, umbilical, so it's probably 15 meters we cut off. Copy. Zero at 15. It's an audio slate, audio slate for dive H1906 at 1951 mark.
Yep. So these numbers, does that change? Is that updating or is it real slow? It's got the little spinny things. Yeah. Well, that's that number's right. The others are. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's there's some tweaking to get those numbers like to totally match up. So, but they're close. Yeah. I'll slow down a bit. Okay. I'm ahead, so I'll just I'll just quit driving down. Wait, no, you're ahead. I take that, I take that back, Jake. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, especially where the lumpus is. Yeah, right. So as soon as we get past the lumpus going the other direction, you can speed back up. <laughs> lumpus? <laughs> coming at me. Well, our number's good.
complete auto centering. For we're operationally, we're keeping the winch cam up because we've been having some problems with a with a lump in there. So um, Argus will be down in the left left side corner, up here. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we yep. have to pay attention to the winch. So. Yeah. Did you zero reps? Um, <clears throat> well, here's what I'm wondering. <laughs> Whether we came around the loop there when we did the drive ahead. I don't think we did. But. Hello, Nautilus Live audience. Thank you for joining us. Well, when we launched, I was I drifted over, so I was. What did I do? The, I was in front of Argus, so I wasn't holding heading. You know, I was just driving ahead. That sort of looks like I did a loop, but. Did I do a loop? 
So we start in here and then, but I was still driving out, right? Like the heading didn't come around, right? Is that true? No, 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 this is actually, this is trail through the water, right? Yeah. Because what happened was we launched and then yeah. they, and then they. If I can went, remember my, I got my chat up here. I just don't remember the, the actual password. But that's all so, right. So, yeah, we started out, out here, and then we were sort of holding position, right? Here? Okay. And then I drifted around and I was on this side. And then when you started driving towards the target, you were coming at me. So I started lateraling, and I came around that way. And now I'm getting dragged behind. So, yeah, well, doing a loop is putting a wrap in, right? <laughs> well, but we hadn't zeroed wraps yet. See the dilemma? But I, no, I, I wasn't holding heading. I was just driving out, just keeping the tension on the tether, right? And I, when, when we started out here, I was here, and I drifted over here. So I was out in front of Argus. So my heading went this way. So now I'm pointed down the way we're going now. So I'm 180 out. Hmm. Well, we weren't in, well, I was always driving out. I guess the, the relationship between the two vehicles didn't change because we kept them stretched out. Okay. Yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So hello to those who are just joining us. We apologize, we were having some technical difficulties, but it sounds like we have our video back up on all the streams. If you are having any difficulty seeing it, we suggest going to the quad view and you should be all fixed. We are descending right now in blue water um, on our way to explore the deep western platform of Palmyra Atoll, um, hoping to get almost 3,500 meters down today. It looked like a nice jelly, a glimpse of one. Yeah, that was cool. So yeah, thanks, Jamie. The, uh, third time's a charm, right? Here we go. <laughs> Let's get down there. Uh, the winds uh, lightened up for us this morning. We endured some morning squalls and then uh, got nice conditions for launch here. So fingers crossed. All right. One of our viewers would like to know about hydrothermal vents and if there are any in the area that we're exploring. Not here. Um, so they're gonna occur where you've got a source of magma beneath the crust such as at a, a spreading center or near a subduction zone where you've got the volcanism on the backside. Uh, 
So out here, there were some sources of magma 70, 80 million years ago uh, when, the, when Palmyra Atoll and Kingman Reef and the other line islands were created, we think. Um, but those hot spots are now far away if they're still active. So we'll see lots of former lava. We'll see a lot of uh, basalt down there, uh, but no vents. Don't expect any. That would be quite a find if we came across a vent. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, those hydrothermal vents are in incredible ecosystems, though. And we got a good look at them at the at the Galapagos. Uh, go away. Is that me? No. <laughs> No, I have another job on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Facilities manager and ROV pilot, same time. Oh, is that another jelly? Venus's oh. girdle. <laughs> yeah, one of the students in an interaction this morning asked me what the most beautiful creature I've seen down here is. And I had to go with the tinafore when they light up. Yeah, tinafores are pretty cool. I love how their little comb rows are always flashing all the rainbows. Yeah. I'm just beating up. Okay. So how long uh, is it going to take us, presumably, to get to the bottom today? It's going to take a couple hours. So we're going to hang what's, tight through the blue water. What's our 3,500? 3,500. 112 minutes. Huh. Thanks, Herc. <laughs> 112 minutes. Almost lunchtime. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So it will yeah, we'll, we'll hand off to the yep. next watch for all the glory. All the glory of the <laughs> bottom. But what about the glory of the water column? Someone's yeah. gonna do it. We well, did. You never know we what got we sharks. See. That was. <laughs> yeah. That was something. <laughs> yeah. Sharks are cool. So and we saw those tina white four, tips. Right? Yeah, that tina four that we saw at the beginning of the dive is really neat. It's all flat. Um, the common name is Venus's girdle, uh, Cestum veneris. I think they're really wild. They're just like, they look like snakes almost. <laughs> yeah. So for those of you just joining us, uh, welcome to Nautilus Live. We have a new watch here in the control van, and I think we should probably go around and do introductions while we descend in the blue water. My name is Jamie Zachariah. I'm the digital media specialist and co-coms lead for this cruise, and this is actually my very first time out with Nautilus, so I am very excited to be exploring alongside all of these wonderful people. Hey, welcome, Jamie. All right, Jamie. I'm Ol Petruncio. I'm the watch lead and uh, expedition leader for this cruise. Um, those uh, false starts aren't my fault. <laughs> 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 we, Mother Nature and mechanical issues, but uh, we persevered. We got a good team on board to troubleshoot through these issues, and uh, Steve Oskovich, our lead scientist, has been working hard to find uh, suitable dive spots. And so here we are, and I think we're... Uh, I think we got a, made a good call with Palmyra Atoll. So it's an area I've been uh, interested in exploring for quite some time when I learned that Kingman Reef and Palmyra Atoll were pristine ecosystems, uh, very healthy coral atoll ecos ecosystems. So happy to be here, happy to be going down for our, our uh, what'll be our first real dive here. I'm Coralie Rodriguez. I'm sitting in the science seat, and I'm a grad student from URI. In the front row, I am sitting navigation. This is Megan Putz from the University of Hawaii. And I'm Robert Waters, the Herc pilot on this watch. Uh, 
Yep. And uh, Jake Bonney, I'm in the Argus seat. Uh, I was actually down in this area three years ago for my internship when I started with the Nautilus. So excited to be back. That is exciting. Yeah. I just finished annotating those dives. So really? Yeah. <laughs> three years later. <laughs> <laughs> Megan lives in a little time warp. <laughs> Dave Robertson, lead video uh, engineer for this expedition and uh, sitting uh, in the video chair for uh, the 8 to 12 watch. Back to you, Jamie. Hello everyone, this is Leilani Sablon sitting on the data logger seat. I'm, this is also my first expedition with EV Nautilus. I'm a, I'm a student at the University of Guam Marine Lab and on this cruise I'm serving as the ocean science intern. So we actually have some questions coming in about those uh, sharks that we saw earlier. Uh, I know it was a brief glimpse, do, do we have any more information on them? People are very interested. White tip, I believe, right? Yep, so yeah. we saw a pair of uh, oceanic white tips. So we often see them in these open ocean areas. They're pelagic species that roam the upper waters and they get attracted to our ship because lots of little fish like to find refuge underneath stable objects in the ocean. So you'll, as we go into DP, small fish will gather by us and the larger fish will come. So we often see them during our dives, at least at the surface, but we won't see them as we get down to our depth today. There aren't going to be any sharks at our deepest depth, but as we come up, we might be able to see other shark species. Also attracts seabirds, apparently. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the seabird situation is real around here right now. <laughs> well, Palmyra is, is a very important part of the ecosystem for seabirds around here. Although we didn't realize we'd be getting quite so close to them, I think, when they took over our top deck. <laughs> yeah, I counted at least 20 uh, on the back deck and up near the control van. And dead fish and squid yep. everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just need a little rest. <laughs> so yeah, I, I uh, saw white tips uh, during the December or November December cruise up by Voyager Seamounts uh, NA134. Uh, they were behind the ship frequently. I saw a fin during our second launch. Uh, I think it it seemed to be cruising along the tether between Heather uh, between uh, Hurricane Argus and. Uh, so yeah, they're out here. Uh, Enrique Sala of National Geographic dove on Kingman Reef and Palmyra Atoll and documented lots of sharks. Very healthy ecosystem. Um, more sharks than you would expect in a typical pyramid food chain. Uh, so the smaller fish are reproducing enough to feed a, a large number of sharks around here. We were also lucky enough to see some marine mammals earlier this morning before our dive. Um, I think, did we come to a consensus that they were bottlenose dolphins? I'm not sure, but it was pretty exciting. Yeah. I was not in on that sighting. Did you see them, Megan? No, I didn't see them. I was sitting in here. Uh. <laughs> Same. Though I'm not an expert on marine mammals at all. Ask me corals any day, but marine mammals, you, you'll have to like get my small little clips of barely any information about them. Well, speaking of corals, um, our audience wants to know what kind of corals do we hope to find today? So uh, at our deeper depths, we'll probably see a lot of bamboo corals, primnoid corals. Um, and then as we get shallower, we'll see a lot more diversity. So what we're going to see is going to change based on our depth, but we'll see a lot of different um, variety of corals for sure. And we'll probably also see a number of glass sponges, which are also a very important part of the ecosystem at these depths. So corals and sponges are ecosystem, you know, constructors. They, they provide structure and habitat in the deep sea. So other animals can use these uh, corals and sponges as their homes and as foraging areas. All right, I'm gonna slow down on the winch a little bit. Roger. We 
have some questions about the weather outside on deck. It's actually a little bit chilly today compared to how it, how warm it has been the past couple days. And it was raining off and on. I know I have long sleeves on for the first time. <laughs> yeah, I looked at the satellite imagery. We were under a pretty good cloud bank. We're we're under the uh, we're located at the intertropical convergence zone, so it's a big band of cloud cover that stretches east west along the meteorological equator. And so, yeah, I think showers are in the forecast, certainly during launch and recovery. That's the way it's, that's yeah. going. That's a given. <laughs> yeah, like, are we launching or recovering? <laughs> it must be raining. <laughs> but yeah, I think the showers kept the temperature down. Yeah. Okay, and so for some of our newer viewers, what is the difference between a coral and a sponge? Because I think we forget sometimes we're experts, but not everyone is. We'll get, we'll get to that one in a moment. So, Megan, we're going to punt this one to you when you have a moment. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think she's clear. Oh, uh, what was the, the difference question? between a coral and sponge, if you will. Okay, so <laughs> big corals difference. and sponges are very different. Um, they're in different phylums. And that means that within the animal kingdom, there are a bunch of different groups. Right. And a phylum Speed is, a, yeah. is right. like a larger group. Um, where these animals are, are, you know, the most different from each other. So sponges um, are very unlike corals, as uh, corals are a colonial organism. Uh, they are in the cnidaria phylum, and they are related to anemones as well. So, like, an anemone is going to be more similar to a coral than a coral is to a sponge. Um, sponges have skeletons that are made up of silica, or our glass sponges are made up of silica, and they provide a similar ecosystem function as our corals do, but in terms of genetic similarity, they're very, very different. Thank you. They both like to have some nice water motion past them, both filter feeders, and they like a nice, uh, most of them, I think, like a nice hard substrate. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, hard substrates are, you know, the most desired locations for corals and sponges uh, in the ocean. So these attachment points, but there are corals and sponges that specialize in rooting in different areas, like in sedimented areas. So like sea pens are a type of coral that often root themselves in sediment. Uh, and they're called sea pens because when they were first discovered, uh, they have this long peduncle that goes down and roots itself into the sediment. And they thought it looked like a uh, feather pen, uh, like an old calligraphy style pen. And that's how they got their name, sea pens. Mm -hmm. But it, as we see them along our drive track today, you'll notice that a lot of them don't look like that because there is a lot of diversity in the sea pen group. You have sea pens that will suction onto rocks. You have sea pens that are long and feather-like. You have ones that look like little starbursts or dandelions. So there, there is a really great diversity down the deep sea with both our corals and our sponges. And I think that's true in general for uh, the biology of the ocean. There is more biomass in the upper ocean where the, in the sunlit zone, the euphotic zone, but there's greater diversity on the seafloor because you've got all these niches for 
for animals to evolve into and, and fill. Uh, so all different habitats and uh, and I think there there is greater diversity of deep water soft corals than in the shallow water coral reefs. Dan mode, dang it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so in terms of uh, the number of species in down. the deep water versus shallow, uh, I think it's uh, over 80% of our known octocoral species live in the deep sea. Wow. But I would imagine they're believed to have evolved from the shallow water species. Or maybe, um, I don't know. I think for some of them, yes, but, but for some of them, no. Like the primnoids are only deep water. Wow. Um, whereas, say, the plexorids, there is some thought that they originated in shallow water and have been adapting to live in deeper water. From no, it's only found deep. All right. Mm -hmm. Can you tell where folks are uh, logging in from? Get Jamie. Yeah, we have viewers from all over: uh, United States, Canada, UK. We've got the Netherlands, Australia, Norway, Germany. We are global. Welcome, folks. Great. Glad to have you with us for the blue water. That's dedication. <laughs> <laughs> well, the blue water actually is going to be pretty interesting, I think, during this dive, just because we are so close to Palmyra, mm -hmm. you're just going to have a lot more input here. So we're seeing yeah. a lot of well, midwater animals, jellies, there have been a lot of fishes, um, tinafores. So it might actually be pretty exciting. Yeah, I guess you get n some We're nourishment. Slipping by them pretty fast. Though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you gotta you gotta like watch out for them. So this is our first cruise of the season, and uh, some people would like to know: Have we made any significant changes or upgrades to our ROVs from last year? Uh, we have a 4K camera on board now. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. Yep, get some really high resolution shots. Um, I don't know. Yeah, in this lake we had the digital still camera mounted down on the oh, yeah. front porch and I think we're going to get some really nice coral images from that. Yeah. We now have a new logging system. We're using Sea Log um, developed by Web Piner and it's a a nice way to bring a bunch of these different logs together. So everybody was logging kind of in different places before, and now we're lo logging in one place. So we'll see how that goes uh, and how everybody likes this new system. It also captures our screen grabs, so we don't have to have a separate system to do screen captures. So, you know, we've got some nice upgrades in terms of keeping our data organized. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your work and what you're hoping to find out here? Yeah, sure. So um, I study ferromanganese crust. So these are rocks that are formed out of the ocean and uh, they form onto other rocks. So first you have a seamount that's made from basalt. And then millions and millions of years later, you can start forming these crusts um, and they kind of form like a sedimentary rock uh, in that you just start forming layers on top of layers above. So they take a really long time to form. I think the average uh, formation rate is one to 10 millimeters per million years. So when you see these crusts on top of rocks, you can know that the rocks underneath are millions of years old. But there's uh, a lot of implications for them. Uh, 
They contain the really enriched and economically valuable elements and metals. And since they take so long to form, uh, some people think that we may be able to use them to figure out past oceanographic regimes. So maybe how much oxygen there was in the ocean at that point, you know, five million years ago or something. And hopefully we'll be able to bring up some good samples. I'm definitely hoping. <laughs> yeah, so we're in the prime crust zone, right? Yeah. So all these Cretaceous era seamounts, uh, 70, 80 million, 90 million years old, there's a lot of time for crust to grow on the, to form on the surface. Oh, what do we have what here? Is that? Siphonophore? Yeah. Some type of siphonophore, I think. Oh, they go by so quick. Yeah. Ooh, it's a little fish. Insane. It was trying so hard. I know. <laughs> oh, Come there back. it is again. Come back. Mm -hmm. I think it might be a hatchet fish. Yeah, that's what I would guess. Yeah. Had the shape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Looks like a little hatchet. Yeah. <laughs> It's actually kind of surprising how small some of these midwater fishes are. Yeah, <laughs> you see the big scary pictures. And oh, I know. <laughs> and they're like little they tiny big, guys. They're like, <laughs> like, the, like the angrily f angler fish, you know, they never yeah. really get much bigger than a baseball. And, uh, you know, you see these big pictures of them, they're like, oh, scary with those teeth. And then they're like, so wee. <laughs> I really like dragonfish. They're like long, attenuated, and have a, a long lure. And they look kind of scary, but they're actually quite small. <laughs> they're all black. Huh. Oh, here's a fun question from our audience. What are the best snacks on chip? <laughs> the ones you bring yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Three-dimensional pineapples. I was going to yes. say, Megan's 3D pineapples. <laughs> bomb. Ice cream sundaes. Sure. Yum. M&M's. Doritos. Peanut huh. M&M's. I forgot to bring my giant bag of M&M's up here. Oh. <laughs> Next watch. <laughs> Always some nice fresh baked thing at two, fourteen hundred, two p.m. or so, and yeah, those chocolate chips the last time were perfect. I've been really enjoying the banana bread. Oh, that yeah. one hits the spot. Knew that was coming. <laughs> yeah, when the banana started getting a little weird, <laughs> I like banana bread time. It was good. I put some brie on the banana bread this morning. Wow. It was definitely <gasps> the way to go. Ah, uh, that's smart. So I believe we All have right. 17 crew members and 33 core members uh, on this. I'm gonna start slowing down. On this trip, okay. 29 science team this time. Okay, 29 and yeah, 17. 17, yeah. And someone asked before if it gets cramped. Um, I don't think so. It's cozy. No. I would say cozy. You, you get to know your shipmates. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, I think it's a good good size for this ship. Good science team. So we'll be taking some of these, these co hopefully collecting rock samples at regular intervals, um, every 200 to 250 meter change in depth, and, and hopefully we'll get two or three at right after we touch bottom. If we're only one, only one. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we're going to change two to three to one. <laughs> <laughs> so. Good to know. Yeah, this is confusing, but. I want to collect one at the bottom 
I want four total. One at the bottom. Uh, and then 200, one every 200 and 250. Yeah. Okay. So these would be, this and those that would be one, this would be two, this would be three, that would be four. And then nothing shallower than 2,800 gotcha. meters. So hopefully we get a good one at 3,500 meters <laughs> before we turn over the watch. We'll see. And then I guess we should also collect, I guess we could collect one if we see one at shallower than 2,800 meters for... For amber stuff? Uh, uh, no, for uh, oh, okay. Beth. Uh, and then Amber also needs some rocks too. But uh, the rocks that she wants, if there's ferromanganese crust on it, she can't use them. Right. They're not as good. Oh yeah, Amber's looking for the nice angular. Yeah, she's looking for fresh basalt and can't be fresh if there's ferromanganese crust because <laughs> then it's really old and altered. So two totally different rocks. Two so. totally <laughs> different rocks in the same location. <laughs> that is our job to figure out. Are we hopeful that we can find both types? Yes. I think I think we are. Yeah, yeah, we normally are able to find at least if one or two of each type. It's the I'd say the angular ones are harder to find. For yeah, sure. especially because a lot of these rocks will, even if they are fresher basalts, they will be slightly, at least slightly encrusted by ferromanganese crust, and that does kind of um, hide uh, the like texture and the angularity of it, and kind of makes it appear more round. Uh, but I'm actually currently working on some rocks from uh, Nautilus when they were around this area before. And um, a lot of them have crust on them, but some of them are angular. So I'm definitely hopeful that we can find some. Great. Yeah, I guess. And with the rocks with crust, the botryoidal texture, mm -hmm. uh, the question is whether they're attached or not. You know, yeah. <laughs> frequently get fooled yeah mm -hmm. keep grabbing jamming <laughs> the arm uh, trying to get it so her cows here is set up I heard you talking earlier in the descent work things out there or do it on the bottom uh, I mean, uh, we don't have any problems right now. No, nope. right. we're good. Good. I don't think we've heard from video, have we? <laughs> days, days. Sure. I introduced myself. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> so one question that we have is about color and its importance in, you know, biodiversity deep down underwater and whether it is or isn't important and why we still see it? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we have to remember that deep down is dark. <laughs> yeah, and we do see some incredible color down there from time to time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a number of explanations for the different colors and that usually depends on what the animal is trying to do. And so as we descend through the water column, you notice a lot of the jellies will have red. Uh, and red is the first wavelength of light to attenuate in seawater. So that's why a lot of these animals you see will be red colors because that is actually the new black in the ocean. So if you're red, you're basically invisible. Are you saying red is the new black? Red is the new black. Mm -hmm. Somebody call Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> And a lot of the jellies, even if they're clear, um, will have red around their stomachs. And that'll actually protect the contents of their stomachs from uh, being seen by a predator. So a lot of the animals down here will bioluminesce. So that means that they're producing 
light. And if you eat something that's glowing, then you are then glowing. So if you protect your stomach and encase it in a red um, pigment, then hopefully it won't show through your stomach and no one will see you. Wow. Mm. Mm. As we get to the bottom, you'll notice that uh, a lot of animals will be yellow or purple, uh, lots of really interesting colors. And those colors can be caused by uh, compounds that they use to deter predators. So you'll see some of the sponges are bright yellow and we think that's because they have a compound in their tissues that you know acts in a certain way, but the color is not the purpose of that compound it is doing something else it just happens to have color and that was not selected against because there's no light down there so being a co doing whatever color you want to be is cool but we love it because you know it's like oh wow that coral is so yellow or that coral is really purple but to the animals down there, they're not seeing that color in the same way that we do. I've heard uh, Steve Oskovich say that for some of them, it's that they used to live near the surface and mm -hmm. they evolved to have a color certain to, for whatever reason, and then they migrated down to the seafloor. As a, that's a potential theory for why some of them are colored certain ways. Absolutely. And there's no, you know, pressure against removing that color so it just sort of sticks around in the same way that we have uh, appendices and we have our wisdom teeth. It, it's a, something that isn't really hurting us and has no real purpose, but it's still there. Well, I'm definitely glad that they still have color. I enjoy seeing them, especially the pink Is ones. That squid? <laughs> That's my favorite color. So the bubblegum corals and what have you. Oh yeah, absolutely. And those bubblegum corals, they'll range in color from like an almost dark red to white. Same with the, a lot of the uh, pink corals, the coralliums. You'll see them vary in color that, you know, even side by side with some of the paragorgia, the bubblegum coral, they'll They'll be very similar in color. I think I'm past Olympus, so okay. speed up. Roger. And here's a question for our video engineer. Uh, we have audience member from Denmark who wants some more information on the camera. Uh, what range is the focus and that sort of thing. Oh my goodness, photography stuff. Um, let's see, that the, the main camera that you're seeing uh, on Satellite Feed 2 uh, is an HD camera from Ikigami. It has a Fujin on it. It's a 17 by zoom lens. Uh, that's all I know about the focal length right off the top of my head. Um, we're bringing our own light with us, and so uh, we, the lens operates generally uh, in the, the mid-range of uh, exposure, about f/5.6 uh, is where we want to where we want to put it. Uh, we can add gain to the video signal if we need to, uh, if we get into a dark area and that kind of stuff, or something outside the pool of light. Uh, generally, if something's outside of the pool of light that surrounds the front of the uh, ROV, we'll pick the ROV up and move uh, towards that object to get it into the pool of light uh, so that we can uh, uh, have good exposure and zoom in on it if we need to. Uh, it's an HD camera. Uh, we also have a 4K camera on board that's uh, uh, serving right now it's sort of experimentally uh, as a uh, 4K still camera that's pointing straight down for bottom views of things. and the. Uh, uh, and Argus has its own uh, HD camera, and it is generally overhead Herc and looking uh, down at an angle to see uh, where Herc is uh, and give uh, situational awareness for the pilots uh, so that they can see any objects that are uh, behind Herc or around it, but not necessarily in its camera view. 
that's about it. We don't have the, the good camera on Argus currently because we're waiting well, for a new lens. Yep, yep. Yeah. it's off for repair, but we, uh, we have the camera that we have and uh, we make do with that. Thank you. Sure. So in case you didn't know, uh, Palmyra Atoll and our dive specifically now is within the boundaries of the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument nearby Kingman Reef. Um, so we do work closely with the Fish and Wildlife Service to make sure that everything that we're doing is um, within the boundaries of what they allow. And we work together to collect some of our samples, be them rock or biological. But this is a very pristine, beautiful area that has a lot of a lot of interesting ecological systems to things to teach us yeah we'll be careful to minimize our impact and uh, but the uh, samples that we collect are going to be shared with the, the broader scientific community and uh, we'll know a lot more about what it is we're protecting in these monuments yeah. <laughs> what are you looking at Jake I don't know I wonder if it's a running average of Oh, it's just, I think it's just not scaled exactly right. Really? Yeah. So the, because it, it's not getting hard numbers from that, the meters, the panel meters output a 4 to 20 milliamp signal that goes into another data logger, and then it has to scale that 4 to 20 milliamps uh, to match so the... That scale? Yeah. Okay. So, scale yeah. Conversion. I mean, we, yeah, maybe you just need to calibrate it yeah. more accurately. That makes sense. So yeah, there's multiple units in that Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. There's Johnston Atoll, then uh, King Kingman Palmyra, Jarvis Island, Howland and Baker. Uh, I, th I think Wake is also part of it. Wake Island. Yep. Um, Wake yeah. is. Thank you. But it's, I've, I've been to Howland Baker and Johnson, and those those are both fascinating dive sites. And uh, looking forward to more pleasant surprises here. It's a very interest geologically a very interesting area. It's like Kingman and Palmyra, part of this big horseshoe-shaped platform that has sort of been, I guess, got areas of collapse and drainage systems like you see in Would mountain ranges on run land. This for a minute. Yeah, and a uh, graduate student who's on board with us, Amber, uh, she's looking at the geochronology, which is looking at the timing of the eruptions. Um, and we can study that using isotopes. And isotopes are when you have an element um, that is, has different forms of the same element, so carbon or uranium, and uh, over time it loses, uh, it can decay um, and change mass. So you can figure out how old something is by uh, how much decay there has been, essentially. The Line Islands, <coughs> the larger chain, uh, uh, hot spot chain uh, uh, seamounts that make up the Line Islands may have multiple sources, multiple formation times. Yeah. It's complex. But, uh, Chris Kelly, uh, who is chief scientist for our Voyager seamount exploration uh, in November, December, uh, had a nice analogy. It's like uh, tracks of sand at the beach. You 
you can see you can use some detective work and figure out what made them and guess when they were made um, and that's what we're doing with this complex system of seamount chains in the Pacific trying to get enough samples to uh, untangle the their formation uh, which hot spots and where those hot spots may be now and or yeah. other, or there are other formation mechanisms beside hot spots. You know, this mm -hmm. thinning of the lithosphere that allows magma to come up. Uh, Rapa Colony has taught me once, but I'm not very good at it. But it's a yeah. way to see where lithosphere may have been using modeling. Um, Apple Colony is going to come out on the Johnston Atoll. All right. Cruise. I have his paper. It's next to my reading list. Yes. <laughs> the, <laughs> the recent one. On. But possibly multiple hot spots is what he was saying in the paper. Yeah. One of the neat things we saw uh, exploring a, a slump area on the side of the southwest side of Johnson Atoll uh, was uh, it revealed a beautiful uh, wall of col columnar basalt. And, oh, wow. Uh, just wasn't expecting to see that. But it can form underwater if it's protected by the exterior uh, lava flow. It can hard cool the same way it slowly cools on land and forms these basalt these uh, octagons or hexagons. And yeah. Fantastic shape. Yeah. There's actually a park, a national park in California. You can go see that columnar. Mm. I've seen it in Washington State. Oh, yes. Really? Yeah, by Mammoth Mountain. Mm -hmm. Devil's Post Pile. Yeah. I've seen <coughs> the columnar basalt down on the bottom, and it was in a in a uh, spiral. Huh. Uh. You mean looking down on the the hexagon hexagonal shapes? Is yeah. Wow. Yeah, and they were in a in a spiral pattern. That's cool. Where was that? You recall? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> in the ocean. Lost in <laughs> lost in the noise. <laughs> I'm thinking off of Guam, though. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. West Pacific. Yeah. There's Lop some off Molokai. Yeah? Yeah. So our data logger today is Leilani, and she's actually from the University of Guam. So Hello. perfect topic, kind of segue <laughs> into that. Is someone tuning in from Guam right now? Well, we were just mentioning it before, oh, okay. so I thought that might be a great way yeah. to open you up to maybe talk about some of the work you do. Sure. So right now, as a master's student, I'm studying Guam's reef-associated fisheries. Um, something that's not really studied at all very much on Guam. And as someone who really enjoys fishing myself, and as someone who just comes from the island, and uh, just being part of like the efforts to build local capacity in STEM in Guam, I decided to go into fisheries, and I really love it. So my study so far is aiming to do some pretty fundamental research, but characterizing different trends in Guam's non-commercial fisheries across different fished regions in Guam and across different fishing methods. So things like size structure variation, uh, species assemblage, species composition, harvested biomass. Um, and that tells us a lot, you know, about like the health of our fisheries. Of course, you know, people are fishing every year, every day, and to be constantly updated on the status of our fisheries is very helpful in generating or even updating um, policies and, and management. So that's what I'm doing right now. Um, hope to graduate at the end of this year. That's right. the goal. <laughs> Go for it.
Do you happen to know, uh, Lelani, if the if you've had bleaching of the corals out by Guam? I mean, they're um, yeah, we we have bleaching on Guam. I can't remember the last bleaching event, but I do remember them being pretty brutal. Uh -huh. um, yeah, but so far they're doing pretty well. We have um, a bunch of restoration yeah. efforts going Slow on down. in Guam too. One other. Yeah, like the Raimundo Lab at Marine Lab. Um, they're constantly out at the restoration sites um, doing good work. Nice. And your trip to get here was um, time travel a little bit, wasn't it? Oh yeah, but, uh, I'm, so I'm from the future. Guam is 20 <laughs> hours ahead, so I traveled <laughs> back in time. <laughs> Just to be on the, the Nautilus. Yep. <laughs> I was very disoriented for a little bit, and just trying to get things right with like calling back home or just scheduling things. It was, threw me off. <laughs> So what are we going to see down here then? You can how how does this dive go? <laughs> <laughs> Twenty hours. Wow. Yep. No spoilers. I don't want to. I don't want to. <laughs> this is a spoiler-free expedition. <laughs> no, we're not going to oh. get it on our watch though. Nope. Uh, Steve in the science chat says, uh, if we are successful, this will be the deepest dive ever in Kingman and, Paul Ryan, and, and Palmyra. Wow. Yeah, the previous record was set by Hercules and Argus in 2019 at 3,225 meters. <laughs> and we're hoping to get to close to 3,500. Yeah. Yep. So. Cool. Fingers crossed we can break that record. Go for that record. And the average depth of the ocean is 4,000 meters, so we're just about hitting average, right? That's awesome. So everything does look like it's going pretty good here. We're holding position well. And That's great. Vehicles are in good shape. We're not heaving too much at all. Yeah, well, what's, what's the yeah. wind speed now, Nev? Dude, can you see? Give me a second. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you a little work, and work to do there. <laughs> uh, wind speed is looking about 22 knots. All right, about the same. All right, speed back up. Okay. We have a question coming in. Um, someone is curious if there is algae deep down in the depths and what that might look like. No, there is no algae below the photic zone. So you're not gonna see it unless it came down from somewhere shallow. So if we did see it at this depth, it would just be dead. And it'd have to survive a lot of predation on the way down. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, any of the f most of the, the food source for the bottom here is whatever rains down from above, unless you're looking at bacteria. Uh, at vents or seeps. <coughs> Bless you. So how deep is the deepest part of the ocean? Someone wants to know. 6,000, I don't know. About, ele about 11,000 meters. Okay, never mind. <laughs> 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 20, <laughs> 20 <laughs> meters. <laughs> Not too far from Guam. Challenger deep. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it was last year, the first Micronesian Someone from the islands actually went down with James Cameron in the Challenger Jeep and made history. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Or uh, with uh, Victor uh, yeah. Vascovich. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> yeah, deep Sea Challenger's at uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic. They're 
it was donated to him. Right. And then it caught fire on a truck on the way to, uh, <laughs> uh, oh. it was on its way to Australia to a museum. I was there for the load up of that truck. From Woods Hole? Yeah. So it, it was a flatbed low boy truck, and I guess they can lower it more to get it through the doorway. And he forgot to bring it back up, so it overheated the, the wheels. <coughs> and it caught fire. The wheels caught fire. Oh, oh goodness. Yeah, burned up half of the submarine. Hmm. That's a very tiny sphere on that thing. Oh, I'd have no interest in uh, <laughs> taking that ride. James Cameron's six <laughs> four. Oh, like he's a big dude. <laughs> and, uh, that's, really that's a pretty claustrophobic <laughs> sphere. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm used to being in the, in the submarines, but that thing's. Really tiny. <laughs> yeah. So our ROV Hercules can go down to 4,000 meters, but has anyone here, what is, what is your deepest uh, limit as a personal record throughout your career? Well, I was, my first, uh, expedition was in the Cayman, Cayman Ridge. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I think we were very close to 4,000 meters on that one. It was, uh, yeah, just about. I don't remember the exact number. It was certainly greater than 3,800. But as navigator, I got an, an appreciation for how long it takes Argus to swing on a move when you're that deep. you got to be really patient on the, these deep dives. How deep have you been, Bob? I've been to 44 or 50 in wow. Alvin, you know, Alvin on a test yeah. dive. And possibly <laughs> I'll get to do a new Alvin test dive. And they're gonna oh, be the going down to 6,500. Oh yeah, boy. They're just oh. shy of 6,500. Didn't wow. it uh, not pass the test last month? Well, <laughs> there is a little bit of issues, but yeah. <laughs> they were minor. You don't get nervous at all going in there? No. <laughs> Pretty safe submarine. Yeah. It's been diving since uh, 64 or so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're up to like 5,000 dives now. Wow. Do the lights on Hercules impact you know, the life down there, or what kind of reactions do we see to that? Well, sometimes. So depending on where you are, a lot of the animals don't have very good vision. But sometimes we see some of the fishes react to the light, like the rat tail fish. They seem to be attracted to the ROV. They'll come mm -hmm. check it out. And they like to follow behind the ROV. So huh. my theory is they're kind of using the ROV as a, a hunting mechanism to like 
scan what's ahead and, and see if there's anything good. Um, a lot of times the cutthroat eels, they'll shake their heads and swim backwards. Um, but the lights on the ROV don't harm these animals. Um, it'd be sort of like flashing a flashlight in somebody's face. Uh, they don't rely on their vision uh, because it's so dark down here. It's, it's not their means of navigating in the way that our vision is our means of navigating our lives. So it doesn't harm them to have the lights, uh, but sometimes you do get a reaction and we're not sure if it's because of the light or because the ROV is really loud or it's this big thing, it's kind of scary. Yeah, that's we're a all hydraulic vehicle, and so it's constantly making a really loud humming noise yeah. that, that I'm sure carries pretty far underwater. So it's safe to say they know we're there. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we don't we can't sneak up on them. Yeah. Which we probably miss seeing a lot of really interesting things because they stay away. Yeah, Luckily, the rocks can can't be. run away. <laughs> yeah. Swim away. <laughs> It, it that would did, definitely make things difficult. <laughs> it didn't seem to scare that uh, sperm whale in the Gulf of Mexico. The no. adolescent checked us out for a while. I am so jealous that I didn't get to see that. Were you on that one, Bob? Hey, <coughs> I had just gotten off watch. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. Darn. <laughs> yeah. And sperm whales, they're the deepest diving of the whales, is that correct? Uh, not quite. No? Uh, Cu Cuvier's beaked whale. Okay. It goes a bit deeper. Uh, uh, over 3,000 meters. I don't recall. It's maybe 3,200. Don't elephant seals dive deeper? I don't, I don't think they get that deep. I yeah, know they go over 2,500, though. Wow. Yeah. I think I've had this exact same conversation on watch before. Yeah. <laughs> I, guess I, had no I know idea. that because I worked on some, some data loggers for elephant seals. Uh. Yeah. Do you have any fun facts about elephant seals? I'm, I'm not. <laughs> really. <laughs> I just did the electronics for the loggers. I didn't really get involved in what they do, but. I did know about the depth, though. When we were off the coast of Washington, we were seeing lots of scour marks on the seafloor near about like 3,000 meters. We weren't sure what they were from, but some marine mammal. Yeah, I think those are those are whales. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. A 2020 article here. It says back in uh, in that year, a, a Cuvier's beaked whale set the record for the longest mm. dive: 222 minutes, wow. three hours, 42 minutes. That's crazy. Yeah. That's very impressive. On Guam, we get beaked whales wash up quite often, like due to like sonar is what they're thinking. Oh. Um, and they just get really disoriented and we get them wash up pretty frequently. Yeah, that particular species, it's interesting.
Oh, back down. Down. oh you're slowing down now. Oh, yep. yeah. Approaching the flange end. We might get deep enough to get past the lumpus on the cable there. Really? Yeah. Hopefully. Did you go past it on shakedown? No. No? We have a question from someone who wants to know how many people here wanted to be a marine biologist as a kid <laughs> and how many people wanted to do something else and then ended up here. Mm -hmm. Any marine biologists? I was That's really right. into dolphins, so I thought I might <laughs> want to do marine biology, but uh, I took bio in high school and I sucked at it, so <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe not. <laughs> I didn't always want to be a marine biologist. I think at some point I wanted to be an archaeologist. Oh. But when I took marine bio in my senior year of high school was when I was like, oh yeah, no, this this is it. This is what I want to do. Yeah. I was definitely I'm one of those marine biology kids. Like, <laughs> save the whales. <laughs> save the sharks. Yep. Yeah, I was always interested in marine biology, uh, but I wasn't very interested in, in whales or dolphins. I really liked the squishy invertebrates. <laughs> <laughs> they were just so weird and wild. Like when I was really young, I was really into bugs and mm. I wanted to get into entomology. Uh, but then I found out about marine biology. I'm like, oh, that's a job. Yeah, that, that's, that's <laughs> what I'm going to do. <laughs> Nineteen hundred. Hundred and thirteen minutes to go. 
All right. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that was the number you gave us at the beginning of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going slower right now, so it's changed. Yeah. Yeah. How fast are we descending? Well, we got to slow down on the, for the cable drum there, we have to slow down on the flanges. In the middle, we can go 30 meters, meters per minute, but at the, at the flange ends, we go about 10 to 12. So I guess uh, I, don't, I don't really have a good number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't realized that. It takes. It's kind of a new procedure. Oh, OK. A there's, a, there's a defect, a lump in the cable, uh -huh. about where it is right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of blocked by the ladder, but you yeah. can see it right there. So we're trying to trying to fix that. Hopefully. We may not be able to get deep enough into the drum to get it out. So we have a question about deep sea audio. Um, obviously we record video and photos, but does anyone have any information about deep sea audio recording and what's possible? Well, I know there's a lot of uh, work going on to record soundscapes uh, of the ocean so we can understand uh, the impact of uh, anthropogenic noise. So we'd like to know what the natural sounds are first. Uh, NOAA has a program in that. We, uh, as Bob mentioned, it's, it's a fairly noisy vehicle. So if we were to, I mean, we did put a hydrophone, I recall we were trying to see if we could record the sound of a uh, methane seeps off the Pacific Northwest along the Cascadia margin. But so we had to put that hydrophone down and then drive away uh, because we make so much noise. So uh, and then we retrieved it later. I don't know what became of those measurements, but uh, mm. yeah, it's not something that we. Oh, here we go. Yes. Marvation house. Lar uh. Marvation. House? Yeah, that's what it looks like to me. That was big. It was a really big one. Yeah. Usually they're not that big. The larvation, so that it's uh, the animals in the middle, and it creates this sticky palace. Uh, so I understand. Yeah, yeah. So they like they create these little mucus houses, and uh, they use them to to filter food from the water column and as protection. And I forget how often it is. It's like every day or every other day they make a new house and they jettison the old one. So most of the ones you see aren't. Occupied. Back up. Huh. That's one way to help cycle the carbon, though. Get it. Yep. They just create <laughs> these little lobs. Speeding up. Yep, speeding up. So, so yeah, there is a need for acoustic measurements, but we're not uh, typically involved in those. <laughs> yeah. There was a study done on Herc back in like the early 2000s to see like the radiated noise from the vehicle and like measure it, quantify it. My uh, advisor, when I was getting my master's, he worked on that. Huh. What did the study find? Loud. It's loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's, there's also been some uh, some work going on in a lab at URI studying like the avoidance um, of creatures as we as we descend. So as we go through that uh, that layer, um, we can see on some echo sounders or uh, sonars that um, there's like uh, the the layer kind of goes up as we as we pass through it, and then back and then comes back down huh. it could, so you can like see that in the in the sonar that's cool what lab is doing that um that was uh i think brennan phillips lab oh okay uh, there's a couple students working on stuff like that yeah i've definitely seen that phenomenon where the animals in that that layer just like scatter and you never see anything other than the jellies because the yeah. jellies can't avoid the roe <laughs> <way. laughs> They can bloop as much as they want, but they're just not going to bloop away fast enough. Uh. <laughs> 
And what is that verb you just used? Bloop. <laughs> <laughs> just checking. <laughs> That's a scientific term. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Jellies are so fascinating to me, how they just, just everything about them, how they exist. Yeah, folks uh, who are tuned in uh, could uh, look at the videos, uh, search the videos on Nautilus Live for the deep staria jelly uh, that we saw at uh, Baker Island. It was quite the shapeshifter. Oh it yeah, that one was wild. It's about four feet in length, but it <laughs> blooped and bleeped and blobbed. And <laughs> it, it turned itself practically inside out. Uh, yeah. No, the thing I think is really wild about it is it has that parasitic amphipod that lives in it, and it's huge. It's like an inch or so in length, which is pretty big for an amphipod. It's bright red. Uh, it also is blind. It doesn't have any eyes, and it feeds on the jelly. Oh, it does. Yeah. I, didn't, I knew I knew it was long for the ride. I didn't know if it was harming it. So it's eating it. Yeah, it's eating wow. it. Wow. And then when I saw it, when I was annotating, I went down a rabbit hole looking for papers about that amphipod. Yeah, they... Uh, yeah, it was Tiffany. Um, she works in the lab with me and uh, has worked with Dave before on a cruise. So she, she and I uh, were, like, sharing information. Biobox stream plug. Oh, wow. Yep. Oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah. That's a slight hiccup. Oh. Hmm. Oh, is it not in there? Like, yeah. let's go back to the... Oh. Well, <coughs> we'll put rocks in those bo boxes, and we'll put the bios in the other box. Um, that's a well, the, we do have the inserts in there, so the water is going to stay in the inserts. It's not going to drain out oh, okay. uh, on the surface, but it's going to be some water mixing. So, yeah, temperature change. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. But it's just it's just the starboard one? That's uh, the, the forward one. The forward one. Just yeah. the forward one. Okay, yeah, well, how about we put rocks in the forward box, and then we put the animals in the starboard box? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's no inserts in the starboard box. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, it should be fine. Yeah. I mean, anything we collect first off is going to get warmed up anyway throughout like the length of our dive. Yeah. Hmm. As long as the water doesn't fully drain out, I think it'll be fine. Yeah, well, it's going to be held in the inserts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the drain's down low. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's not like catastrophic, but yeah, it's going to mix, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So you were saying to put the put the bio samples in starboard box? Um, no, I think we can keep them put them forward. Okay. I don't think the the mixing of the water will be significant enough to impact the samples that we collect. Just uh, be advised, like if you pick up something really fragile, it could get. Yeah, with the insert less in there, there's not that much yeah. water movement. Yeah, you know, I think it'll be fine. Because it's up against the hole, right? Yeah. 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 If it was if it was an open box, that'd be bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was repaired. Yeah. That's Steve's question, because he did check them out. I, th I think it was repaired. I, I know it was repaired. I don't know if it was watertight. 
Yeah, that would be bad. I think that's the correct spelling. I should put. Uh, You can see it. No, that's <laughs> an impossible. That's, a, that's an impossible task. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, camera's not over far enough. Oh, you'd have <laughs> to push the box up, but it's not. You can't see that side of it. Yeah. No, no yeah. that ain't happening. We do want to put that away, though, because we don't have like a just a big yeah. collection of those. Pick the scoop up, drop it in there. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Might. It's pretty wild. No, it gets pulled. At gets pulled at the post dive, you know, to drain the water out of the box and clean the box out. And it just neglected to get put back <laughs> in. Yeah. Well, hopefully not. Yeah. Yeah. It's Man, this is data lab. This shouldn't affect you in any way, but I'm gonna power cycle the Stellcam computer. We have a question asking, what is the metal pin that you can see in this scoop? <laughs> <laughs> That's for the forward bio box. We, uh, we, when the, when the boxes come up, they hold all their water. They're, they're sealed. Well, they're supposed to be sealed. Um, and then we, we pull that plug. It's down near the, the bottom of the, the box to drain the water out after we've removed the samples. After, sci after the science team has collected all their goods. But it's currently not in there. <laughs> yep. But at least on the forward box, we have uh, these plastic inserts. So um, it's not, not all the water will be drained out. Uh, so there's that. Yeah, which will be fine. So the water is going to keep our samples cold. And yep. since the water isn't going to be leaving the box, our samples will be fine coming up. It's just, that's just an added precaution and an ease of maintaining the vehicle after a dive. I'm gonna slow down at the flange. Roger. I need to catch up anyway. It looks like that water temperature is already down about two degrees. The winds have come down too. We're about 14 knots. How deep are we? We're currently at 2,290 meters. So we've got about 1,500 meters to go. So past halfway, but we will not see bottom on our watch. Hmm. Take one for the team. 
Yep. <laughs> Corley and I are, have uh, had lots of blue water experience. Yeah. <laughs> Almost criminal how much blue water experience I have. <laughs> You're the first blue water geologist. <laughs> Do you just happen to be on watch every time the dives are going? Yeah, down our dives were always, they always started them and then did them on our watch. There was a lot of blue water last year. So you're just going through what will eventually become manganese crust. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You're like, ooh, look at these potential precipitates. <laughs> <laughs> I was on an expedition a year ago uh, with our friend Tiffany, mm -hmm. and uh, we were out six weeks. I saw the bottom twice. <laughs> ooh. Oh, and we were doing midwater transects looking at jellyfish and other. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. And so when we hit the bottom, it was immediately, oh, there's the bottom. Come up 50 meters. <laughs> <laughs> Start a transect. Go for a kilometer. Speeding back up. Nothing but blue water for Speeding six up. weeks. It's a lot of blue. That is a lot of blue. Pilot, this is Data Lab. Could you cycle, uh, power cycle the still cam for me? It's not connecting when I did it. Roger. Roger that. Got it. So how deep can light pierce? Well, that depends on where you are. About 200 meters usually. Yeah. yeah. Well, you can you can see deeper than that. Yeah. Uh, Photic zone's about yeah. 200, 200 meters. meters. Yeah. All right, You're sufficient. not going to get photosynthesis below that point. Right. Yeah. You can still see light though. If you're looking straight up from mm -hmm. the twilight zone. Yeah. yeah, probably about a thousand meters is like the last point where you can see light. Yeah, those are the numbers that I remember. Yeah. There's a lot of work uh, on the part of Woods Hole recently uh, due to some private grants uh, to study the twilight zone uh, because we know so little about those animals that migrate through it and fishing boats are now capable of starting to reach down to that depth before we know the impact of fishing at those depths. But yeah, we're, so we're beyond the, beyond the twilight zone. We should have the theme music queued up. Every time <laughs> someone says that, I can... There you go. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> I miss that show. <laughs> that was a good show. I wonder were there any episodes about the ocean? I can't think of any. There was a lot about space. Yeah. yeah. But you have to remember the times. That's true. That was the frontier because going to space <laughs> seemed easier than going to the ocean. It is. <laughs> Here's a funny question. Do you ever dream about blue water? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. All the time. <laughs> you say nightmare? <laughs> blue water. Yeah. Blue water and white sand. <laughs> I used to have nightmares as a kid of being in the open water with big animals around me. And <laughs> really? Yeah. And like, I'm totally not afraid of swimming in the middle of the ocean, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I 
I know a certain uh, SCF that might have some nightmares about brown boobies. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have had a particular number of birds interacting with us today, not to everyone's delight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're they're quite the personality, that's for sure. Oh yeah. So Mark and I ushered one off the back deck before the launch and it he was, was, was protesting. It was, it was <laughs> giving Mark a near full. Yeah. They are clumsy. They're not built for solid surfaces. Yeah. I think he'd eaten too much fish and he didn't have enough takeoff area to get off yeah, the deck. Yeah. They're not the most, you know, elegant when they <laughs> land or take off. They usually just sort of crash. <laughs> but they're a good indicator species. A healthy seabird population means healthy fish. Yeah, I wanted to come out just to see what sort of like fish species they were spitting out. Just the fish <coughs> near me. It's like there, a, there was flying, flying fish. fish. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? yeah. <laughs> I had to usher a few of those back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was squid and flying fish and yeah, some like, unidentifiable fish parts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One threw up. I don't even know what it was. It just smells really bad. <laughs> yeah. There's so much you can learn though from like what animals are spitting out. Like on Guam for sea turtles, um, we've been able to discover like new algae species just based on like the stuff that the sea turtles were eating. So, oh, that's yeah. interesting. I guess that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's the best. That's yeah. I think we all start science. You guys remember, like, you know, in fifth grade with the owl pellets that you dissect. Yes. It's like, that's how you start to learn about yeah. the food chain. The worms. <laughs> yeah, and on the bright side, they weren't uh, throwing up plastic, you know. It was yeah. That is true. Fish. Yeah. <laughs> At least not that we could see. Yeah. So we have a question coming in about preparing elementary age students to participate uh, in ship to shore interactions, which if you weren't aware, we do ship to shore interactions with classrooms, museums, or anyone who signs up for them. And you can do that right through our website at nautiluslive.org. And also through our website, we have a plethora of resources for teachers and for anyone who wants to learn about the ocean, um, be it engineering, art, science, what have you, we have resources available for all ages. And I highly suggest you look through that and find the one that might match up with your interests and with your learner's abilities to give them kind of a background. And we also have a great video uh, that we recently put up, I wouldn't say like maybe a month ago, a new ship tour that, might, that will get you acquainted with EV Nautilus before you can do the ship to shore interaction and just anybody who's interested what it looks like uh, aboard the ship. I noticed one of the resources uh, publicized recently was uh, the poetry of Jessica Sandoval. Yep, it's Hurt. World Poetry Day. <laughs> Hurt pilot, all oh, right. One of our Hurt pilots, uh, recently recognized by the Explorers Club. That's right. Uh, one Wonderful honor. And she's a poet. What can't she do? <laughs> 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 We also have flashcards, A to Z flashcards that I'm a big fan of. All right. Um, beautiful drawings. So we're in day seven of our cruise. It's time for our antigen tests after we get off watch and hopefully yeah. our final day of wearing face covers. Been very careful about COVID out on the ship until next time, until we get ashore again. Yeah. yeah. Still gotta be, yep. Absolutely. This has a lot of care.
Yeah, it was <coughs> the test was supposed to be from 10 to 11. Oh. And then uh, we're well, going to do one, one to two. two. Oh, yeah, one second. to two. Okay. Bob, I have a question for you. What is the most challenging part of piloting Herc on the bottom? Um, I think that the hardest thing to do is to do something that's like, it's really boring, but you have to use all your attention to stay on it. It's like, <laughs> like some okay. of those are like following a train of bubbles up to the water column. It's just, that's really tough. <laughs> <laughs> or I've had to fly over the bottom and maintain an exact altitude without an automatic altitude hold. And like, because they were counting, we were just going over a mud, flat mud bottom and, and counting how many sea cucumbers there were per acre or something. Oh yeah, like and, trans <laughs> uh, just and you had to like, just, you're wow. focusing on a mud bottom and trying to stay exactly one 1.1 meter off the bottom. <laughs> and there's probably a slight slope. So you yeah, yeah. Like it's like, so you got to use all your attention to stay there, but it's, yeah. Uh, I've been inside some shipwrecks and that's pretty challenging. Oh, wow. Yeah, I've actually gone in the engine room on a bulk ore carrier. Huh. I've been right to the wellhead on Deepwater Horizon. Wow couple times actually. <laughs> the really exciting stuff is when Bob Ballard's on here and he'll <laughs> he'll be hanging right on my shoulder. <laughs> So speaking of those sea cucumbers, the uh, when we were in Astoria Canyon off of the off of Oregon, uh, the tidal currents in there were so strong. The sea cucumbers on the sea, on the uh, floor of the canyon all lined up. Uh, they aligned with the current. It looked like they were sentient beings, you know, coordinating their <laughs> motions. But they, if they didn't. You know, the current was so strong that they would just tumble. So they they figured out, align themselves along the axis of the canyon and the currents would just flow over them. But uh, Herc was able to just drift with the current at about a knot and a half or so. No, no thrusters. That was one of these cruises where we were looking for the bubbles that Tim Bob mentioned, the methane seeps. And we found uh, found methane right in the floor of the canyon. It was kind of unusual. A little rocky cliff with s solid methane hydrate. We have a question here about salinity and minerality of the water and if there is a correlation to depth. Uh, well, let me look at the salinity. Oh, no data. <laughs> um, salinity, I don't think, I think it's pretty uniform across all depth. Y you'll have uh, various <laughs> water masses that, that can, you can trace by their temperature and salinity. Um, but yeah, we don't have a lot of variation. Variance, yeah, you there. don't get any variation like you see with oxygen or temperature. It's around like 30, 35 range. Uh, uh, PSU, sorry. At the surface, you'll see some fresher salinity is due to the rain in the Pacific. Pacific gets a lot more rain than the Atlantic. 
so you get some fresh water on the surface. But uh, yeah, once you're below the mixed layer. So are all oceans like roughly the same in salinity or? No, no. no. You'll get, I think the Atlantic is saltier. Uh, certainly the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean is, is the saltiest. Yeah. Someone would like to know if there's a difference between the methane gas that you measure in the sea and that that's being measured on land. Well, it's still methane. Uh, <laughs> the way it's produced would, might be a little bit different. Uh, so you've got, so off the Pacific Northwest, <coughs> where the uh, Juan de Fuca plate is subducting beneath the North American plate, you're scraping off sediment, it piles up, and the bacteria will decompose the organic matter in that sediment and methane is a byproduct. Some of it's produced, I think, just due to temperature and depth, uh, pressure and depth. Uh, uh, but and that's generally how you make it on land is you have yeah. organic matter and put it under high pressure and temperature and eventually you get crude oil natural gas. And so the methane that bubbles up from the seafloor, it's believed that most of it is absorbed in the water column, dissolves in the water column before reaching the surface. But uh, there are some shallow methane seeps where I know you've got slicks on the surface, so there could be some getting into the atmosphere. The main concern for methane entering the atmosphere, I believe, is in the Arctic with the tundra uh, right. permafrost. As that melts, it'll be releasing some large amounts of methane. Well, we found thousands of seeps in the, off the Pacific Northwest just since 2016, really. We just discovered so many. Were you expecting to find that? I think we were surprised at the number. Yeah. Uh, the Pacific Marine Environmental Lab in Seattle, PMEL, has been working with that data, and uh, they have some information on it. If folks want to learn more, yeah, go to NOAA's uh, Pacific Marine Environmental Lab, and uh, you can read about the methane exploration for methane seeps. And uh, just an FYI, we're about to go on a watch change, so if it becomes silent, that's why. Back up. Okay. More time, Jake.
So how much longer do we have till we get to the bottom, we think? Uh, 25 minutes or something? Right after the watch change, yeah, naturally. Yeah, of course. I'll be watching. So we've had some good questions from the internet. We have. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you everybody for tuning in and for submitting your questions. Hey, you can help out the 12 to 4 watch. Keep the questions coming. <laughs> For those of you just turning in, we are in the middle of a watch change, so you might um, hear a little bit of nothing for a little bit, but soon we will be back online, and very soon we'll be at the bottom of the ocean. So stay with us and keep your questions coming, and thank you for joining us.